Have you ever thought that something is so good that it can't possibly be real? Have you ever thought that something is too good to be true? What about in the reverse? Have you ever thought about something and thought, that's so awesome, it has to exist. That's so great, it has to be real. No? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Dr. Byron's Office Hour is here, and what we're going to talk about today is St. Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God. That's a mouthful. Uh, here are some study guide questions in order to help us talk about this. What is an ontological argument for theism? What is the overall strategy for Anselm's ontological argument? What is the simple version of Anselm's ontological argument? What is the basic line of reasoning at work in Anselm's argument? What is Gaunilo's objection to Anselm's argument? What is Kant's objection to Anselm's argument? What is the existence-neutral objection to Anselm's argument? What is the unchristian objection to Anselm's argument? As always, the answers to those study guide questions are going to be covered in the course of this video, so you might want to fill out some answers as you watch the video. First, what is an ontological argument for theism? An ontological argument for theism, as opposed to some other kind of argument, is an argument that attempts to prove the existence of a god or the existence of gods on the basis of the god or the god's natures, based on what the god is like the god must be. That is an ontological argument. It's an argument which attempts to infer the existence of a divine being based on some claim or claims about the divine nature. One of the more famous, if not the most famous, ontological arguments is that of St. Anselm of Canterbury in his Proslogion, chapter 2. It is right here. Therefore, Lord, you grant understanding to faith. Grant that, insofar as you know it is useful for me, I may understand that you exist as we believe you exist, and that you are what we believe you to be. Now we believe that you are something than which nothing greater can be thought. So can it be true that no such nature exists, since the fool has said in his heart there is no God? But when this same fool hears me say, something than which none greater can be thought, he surely understands what he hears, and what he understands exists in his understanding, even if he does not understand that it exists in reality. For it is one thing for an object to exist in the understanding, and quite another to understand that the object exists in reality. And surely that then which a greater cannot be thought cannot exist only in the understanding. For if it exists only in the understanding, it can be thought to exist in reality as well, which is greater. So if that than which a greater cannot be thought exists only in the understanding, then that than which a greater cannot be thought is that than which a greater can be thought. But that is clearly impossible. Therefore, there is no doubt that something than which a greater cannot be thought exists both in the understanding and in reality. Well, that's quite a mouthful. What is the overall strategy for this argument? What Anselm is saying in this passage is that if you try to claim that God does not exist, you will end up contradicting yourself. In other words, when the fool says in their heart that there is no God, they are saying something incoherent. They are contradicting themselves. To put the matter another way, you can derive a contradiction from the claim that God does not exist. And any claim from which you can derive a contradiction is a claim that must be false, since no contradiction can be true after all. So, this is a way of proving that it's false that God does not exist. Or in other words, proving that God does exist, 
based on the idea that if you claim God doesn't exist, you are contradicting yourself. There are a lot of different versions of Anselm's argument, some of them more and some of them less charitable to Anselm, some of them having a greater and some of them having a lesser aim to be exegetical and correct to what Anselm says. And there are many different versions of an ontological argument for theism, which are inspired by or purport to be reinterpretations of his argument. We're just going to look at one such presentation. It's what we'll call the simple version of Anselm's ontological argument. It goes like this. First, God is the being than which none greater can be conceived. Suppose, for reductio, that God does not exist in reality, but only exists in the understanding. Here I'll pause and mention what it means to suppose something for reductio. The argument form reductio ad absurdum consists in doing this. You assume something to be true in order to show that if this thing is true, then some crazy thing would have to follow from it. And that's how you know that this thing is wrong. In other words, you assume a claim to be true in order to demonstrate that it leads to an absurdity. So what we are doing here is we're going to assume that God does not exist and then derive a contradiction from that. That would mean it's contradictory to say that God doesn't exist. And that would be an argument for God's existence. This argument, in fact. Let's continue. Third, we can conceive of a being, X, which is exactly like God, but exists in both the understanding and reality. Fourth, that which exists in both the understanding and reality is greater than that which exists only in the understanding. Fifth, so X is greater than God. Sixth, but this is a contradiction. A contradiction from 5 and 1 was derived by assuming 2. Seventh, so 2 must be false. God exists in both the understanding and reality. So what's the basic line of reasoning here? It's this, that God is the best possible being. The best possible being that than which none greater can even be conceived. And, on that basis, it has to exist. Because you can't be great if you don't exist, and God is the greatest. So God must exist. The argument boiled down goes something like this. If God did not exist, you could imagine something which was exactly God-like, but which also had the feature of existence. And that thing would be greater than God, which contradicts the idea that God doesn't exist. So God must exist. It's the idea of deriving something's reality from its excellence. The idea that something is so great that it could not possibly fail to exist, for that failure would be a tarnishing on its greatness. There are versions of this argument which proceed enumeratively. They say God has all of the excellent features that makes for a perfect thing, existence is one of them, and so God must exist. But Anselm's simple version proceeds a bit differently. It begins by asking you to assume that God doesn't exist, and then realize that if God didn't exist, something else, which was exactly like God but existed, could be greater. And not that that thing must be, but it's conceivable. And so there would be something that was conceivable that was greater than God. God, which by definition is something that you can't conceive anything greater than. Oops, there's the contradiction. Let's talk about objections to this argument. How might it go wrong? Historically, Anselm's most famous objector is Gaunilo of Marmetier, or Marmetier, and his objection proceeds like this. If Anselm's argument were sound, we could securely prove the existence of a perfect island, among other things, just by thinking about it. But surely we cannot prove the existence of a perfect island just by thinking about it. So Anselm's argument is not sound. Either it has a false premise, or it has an invalid inference. 
In other words, if we were to accept Anselm's argument as sound, we would also have to accept several other arguments whose conclusion was the existence of other things that were absolutely absurd. If we could prove the existence of the perfect being, objected Gaunilo, then we could also prove the existence of the perfect island. And we don't have to stop with islands. We could prove the existence of the perfect cupcake or the perfect hedgehog or the perfect pet or the perfect warrior or the perfect car. We can construct a parody argument like this. First, Tralala is the island than which none greater can be conceived. It's the best island. It's the best island. Second, suppose, for reductio, that Tralala does not exist in reality, but only exists in the understanding. Third, we can conceive of a being, X, which is exactly like Tralala, but exists in both the understanding and reality. Fourth, that which exists in both the understanding and reality is greater than that which only exists in the understanding. Fifth, so X is greater than Tralala. But six, a contradiction would then arise between five and one. And we got this contradiction by assuming that Tralala did not exist. So it must follow that Tralala exists. There, I proved the existence of Tralala. Join me as we go there to enjoy a better life than what we have here. No, that's absurd. And because it's absurd, and because you would have to accept it as sound if you accepted Anselm's argument, so, reasons Gaunilo, Anselm's argument must be flawed in some way. It must be that a thing's perfection is no argument for its reality. Something may be perfect and yet not be real. So goes the objection. Or more correctly, so goes an objection. Another objection comes from the philosopher Immanuel Kant, or at least this objection is most popularly attributed to him. It lies in the idea that existence is not a feature of individuals. In the Critique of Pure Reason, he writes, To posit a triangle and cancel its three angles is contradictory, but to cancel the triangle together with its three angles is not a contradiction. It is exactly the same with the concept of an absolutely necessary being. If you cancel its existence, then you cancel the thing itself with all its predicates. Where, then, is the contradiction supposed to come from? If you say God is not, then neither omnipotence nor any other of his predicates is given, for they are all cancelled together with the subject, and in this thought not in the least and in this thought, not the least contradiction shows itself. It's a deep thought, but consider it this way. First, imagine a triangle. Now, imagine an existing triangle. Is there any difference in what you're imagining? No? Let's try it with something else. Maybe it's just something special and weird about triangles. First, imagine a cat. Now imagine an existing cat. A cat that's just like the first one, except it exists. Is there any difference in the qualitative character of the cats? Any difference in how great they are in your imagination? No? So whether the triangle exists does not seem to contribute anything to how the triangle is. Whether the triangle is, in other words, seems to be a different affair from how the triangle is. In other words, Existence is not a feature of individuals. It's not a property of individuals in the way that other things could be. There is also some Kantian psychology assumed here, that what it is to assert a contradiction about an individual is to assert that it has contradictory or opposite properties, and that that's very different from, say, denying its reality altogether. That if you want to end up with a contradiction about something, what you need is that thing with opposite features being applied to it. That's a contradiction. But saying that the thing is not can just never be a contradiction. That's not the type of thing a contradiction about an object is. That presupposes more of Kantian psychology. But we can phrase Kant's objection this way, that existence is not a feature of things. It's not a property of things. What is it then? 
That's a good question. Maybe somebody who raises this objection should have something to say about that question. Now we should distinguish what we're calling Kant's objection from what we'll call the existence neutral objection. This is the objection which says, existence is a feature of things, it is a property of things. Existing is like being round or being red or being awesome. Existence is a feature. It's just that nothing is made greater by having it. Nothing is made more excellent by having it. In other words, from the mere fact that something is perfect in every way, it does not follow that it must exist. For existence is not something that a perfect being would have to have. In other words, existence does not contribute value to anything. That's what this objection says. It says that existence does not contribute any value to anything. Now, someone might hear that and say, what? That's ridiculous. But, but if, God, if God exists, that's so much greater. But here we should distinguish two things. On one hand, it would be great if God existed. That's something that you may agree to whether or not you believe in a God. Versus, God would be greater by existing. Or, the feature of existing makes God great among other features. As opposed to, existence makes a thing greater. The thing that exists is greater because of its existing, as opposed to not existing. Two different things. And someone who levels this objection is going to emphasize that difference and say, the intuitions which play in Anselm's favor are actually directed at this target and not the other. And what is the unchristian objection to Anselm? Well, it's a matter of very careful scorekeeping. Remember, Saint Anselm was a Christian saint, and this argument is an argument for the existence of a perfect being a being than which none greater can be conceived, the greatest possible being. One needs an additional argument or a set of arguments to show that that being is the same person as the man who was crucified by the Romans named Yeshua from Nazareth. In other words, Anselm's ontological argument, even if sound, will get you all the way to theism, but it doesn't get you by itself all the way to Christianity. For that, you would need other things. And to simultaneously focus on that point while foreshadowing the readings to come, let's ask whether even Anselm's ontological argument requires monotheism. Does it? The argument proves the existence of a best possible being. Something must exist because it's best. Does that mean that there could only be one of them? Does the notion of the best require uniqueness? On one hand, you might think that the grammar of superlatives alone, the very logic of the term best, means unique. You only have one of the best, after all. But that seems a little hasty. Can you have more than one best friend? Could something be best in different ways? Could there be ties for the best? If polytheism is to be ruled out, it's not going to be ruled out by the premises which lead to St. Anselm's conclusion. It must be ruled out by additional work. So, in addition to not even getting you all the way to Christianity, Anselm's ontological argument may not even get you all the way to monotheism, just to some theism. But we'll talk more about that in the lectures to come. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.